good afternoon everyone and you're very welcome to today's session um thank you for joining the the nesta talks to juno sullivan uh session today for anyone who isn't familiar with uh these sessions they're put on by nesta to bring in some of the leading thinkers um on the big topics of our time that face our society both in the uk and internationally and no better person to speak to than, than juno sullivan when it comes to all things earlier so we're delighted to have her um, with us today. Um, before I pass over to June, I'll just say a few brief words about myself. I am Fanula O'Reilly. I'm a principal advisor at the Behavioural Insights team, where I lead uh, our work on early years. And I'm actually on secondment at Nesta for about a year or so, uh, working with their Affair Start mission team. Um, that team is dedicated to narrowing the gap between children from advantaged and disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, during the early years so that by the time they uh, are ready to go to school at age five, they are socio-emotionally and cognitively ready to learn. Um, and we do that by way of a number of partnerships with local authorities and early years providers and educators. Um, our team is made up of data scientists, behavioral scientists, designers and many more. And so we work with our partners to innovate some of their existing services and to, to uh, introduce new ones where that's appropriate. Um, if anyone listening today would like to hear more about our, our work, um, please do drop us a line afterwards and we'll be putting up contact details for that uh, at the end of this session. Just a couple of things on housekeeping. Uh, we really want this to be a two-way conversation today um, between myself, June and you. So please do add your comments, uh, reflections, observations and questions to the chat as we're going along and I will do my best to weave them into the conversation. Um, so we're delighted to have June O'Sullivan, who is the Chief Executive of the London Early Years Foundation, uh, which is really one of the leading enterprises, uh, social enterprises in, in the early years uh, sector. Um, June is also a tireless campaigner for all things early years and um, uh, always looking for new ways to influence policy and to make society a better place for children and families. So welcome, June, uh, thank and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'll thank hand you. over to you to uh, say a further introduction, and then we'll get into the questions, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, as Fanula said, my name is June. I run LEAF, and it is, I think, currently at least the largest childcare social enterprise in the UK. If there's anyone bigger than us, I'd love to meet you because it's it's not good just being on your own in there. We need to be a network of social um, enterprises. Um, we currently work in London. London has the highest level of poverty anyway, so it's a good place to start. And we currently have 39 nurseries, but we're about to increase that to 41. Um, that means we have about 820 staff and about 4,200 children any any given day. And included in that is my lovely apprentices that are between 60 and 100. And the reason I'm, I have these vague numbers is because they're at various stages of completion. So um, the intention is that we keep most of them because they're they're a pretty, pretty good um, group of people. And I'd like to hang on to them in the early years, though I don't mind if they go to somewhere else once they stay with us in, in our sector. Our business model is uh, re reasonably simple, um, but actually like anything that's simple is actually quite complex beneath it beneath it all but effectively what we do is we have a fee structure that enables us to subsidize uh, at least 30 percent of our children if not more i'd like to be always heading towards the 40 percent where we actually can support children who would otherwise not be able to attend the nursery and that's because the um the structure of the funded places aren't always guaranteed to um to provide accessible and affordable access for uh, so many children. So we, for example, the two-year-old offer, we provide the largest amount of that in, in London. So it's it's uh, it's a kind of, it's sort of a sort of Robin Hood model, if you know what I mean, that actually, you know, we use what we earn to ensure that the money is spent on other children so that there is that kind of um, approach. So we're not like a charity in the sense of having to raise money for a particular um, project and then spend on it. The model itself is built in so that the, uh, the children are part of the way we do things. And the model is itself socially enterprising in that. So we don't have to, um, 
I suppose, to some degree, take take the king shilling. And so therefore we have a level of independence that allows us to innovate and to reject some of the um, government policies that we feel are not in the interest of children. So, yeah, it gives, gives me a, a, a voice uh, yes. so I can be as, as outspoken as I am. But I would <laughs> probably be that anyway. But yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jean. Um, I suppose just a follow up question on that. I wonder, could you tell us a little bit about the impetus for starting LEAF um, and how it has progressed and grown over the years? Um, there is a lot of uh, research about what, what motivates someone to become a social entrepreneur. And um, there's a, a great guy called Charles Ledbetter, who I'd love to meet and have a proper conversation with, who said many, many years ago that actually um, it's usually to fix something in your own personal life, in your family's life or in your friend's life that you tend to respond. And, and to some degree, I've never really talked about this, but this is precisely why I did what I did, because when I was very, uh, very young, uh, single parent, um, I went. I didn't know what to do to, to, uh, to, you know, to look after my child and go to work. I was a nurse. I was a psychiatric nurse, and the NHS at the time wasn't particularly keen on part-time workers. I are not particularly keen on single parents either. So I didn't know what else to do. So I wanted to work, continue to work nights, so that I could look after him in the day. But I, I felt a nursery would be a good place to go, and finally found one. I mean, honestly, it was so hard, and. They didn't a let me settle him which i thought was odd now i was just you know very very young and so i didn't really know but i grew up in a, a reasonably large irish family so for me the sense of you know looking after your brothers and sisters was kind of in sort of embedded it didn't feel right to leave the child crying you know i remember you used to be called down to eat, oh golly when i was in year four so i must have been about 10 being called out when my sister one of my sisters had started school and she was crying constantly and i used to be taken out of my classroom and brought down to look after her i used to be so fed up with this idea that this child would she stop crying um but so it, it didn't feel right to me that that my child should be crying when i left but i gave it on day one i thought well maybe this is the way they do things here day two i went and turned up at the nursery and he was in the garden by the by the fence and i thought this isn't right you know and the parents in front of me were looking a bit kind of um amazed as well so i picked him up and you know and 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 you know as you do so to take a child to your chest and kind of look after them and uh i went to the to the the, the manager and she started shouting at me about oh you know i could have given this place to a doctor you know you irish single parent and the whole thing i just couldn't get over it i was kind of standing there thinking I don't know. I'm a nurse. I work for I work for a living. I take money from no one. What is this about? And I just sort of in my head then thought one day, one day, you know, I will create a model where people can access a nursery and you never it doesn't matter who you are, or what you are, but also that your child is full and center in the way that they would be looked after and, and educated and you would be felt to be welcomed no matter who you were and where you came from. And I took him away and I never went back. And one of my colleagues, uh, a nurse from Guyana, her mother used to come and stay in the house at night for me so I could work and, and look after him. But it was such a challenge at the time. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was really hard. And I just thought I can do that. So gradually over the years, I built up my experience. I became a social worker. I was a social worker for 10 years working with the under eight in Battersea. I learned a great deal. You know, I, I'm not one of those who came in and, and took this very fast sort of journey. I didn't. I actually did a lot on the ground to really understand what it, feel, what it feels like. And gradually, you know, I, I did other things. I became um, a training person in, in Hackney. I worked in Surrey to actually set up their first early years unit and stuff. So I kind of built my experience. And then you never know. What, the life is so serendipitous that one day I would join this tiny charity in Westminster and that would be the platform from which I could build the very thing that I've always wanted to. And then it was very, also very interesting, and it's probably for the audiences out there, that actually you often don't know what you are till someone names you. And so I was busily trying to figure out how we would be independent and not dependent on, on grants and and money because I could see that's not the way to hold an early years sector together it just wouldn't it just didn't seem right and, and as a sensible business option I didn't know this was had a name for all of this until someone said that's what they call a social uh, enterprise and and that was really at the beginning of the social enterprise movement and so um, we have grown now and I think there is a complete positive uh, attitude to 
businesses with a social purpose at their heart still does that you know still um creating a profit because we do create a profit but you're using that profit in a way that actually motivates and strengthens your social purpose rather than is you know a dividend you know spread out as a dividend or are um you know these the top tier get paid a vast quantity of money so that there's a big gap between what you earn and what your apprentice earns and stuff so yeah so the, the world of social enterprise is is really well placed uh for the early years and i would i would urge anyone out there and i, I you know anyone in universities and other uh organizations that are doing research and stuff to really start thinking about what we can do to create that piece of cheese on the cheese board so it's not to say that they don't have private sector or you know preschools or charities that's not to say uh, you know and childminders they're all very important but the cheese board also has a place for social businesses that where social purpose is about affordable accessible services to those children those those children that are absolutely excluded and you know and it's not fair and it's not right that they are because they happen to be born into poverty or a single parent or in a circumstance where people don't know what quite to do you know these children have a right to to access uh you know really good quality education and far too often you know Ofsted's um research sort of continues to depress me in the sense that you know, we're still not shifting out of that. You know, their recent research, and I know they're due to put some more data in for November, but their March research, you know, shows 19%, 19% of um, services based in poor neighborhoods are outstanding. Only 19%. That's, you know, you can, I know you can out there, you can all argue with me about whether it's a good measure or it's not a good measure. And, you know, Ofsted has its moments, but the fact is Ofsted is the measure right now. And so, you know, why is that? And 22%, you know, in the better areas. LEAF is 52%. So it, it shows that you can do this. You can drive quality in, you know, in areas of poverty. You can, you can actually make a difference. And so I just think that, you know, we must really understand that, that, that it's possible. I, I mean, it's my life work. And so I'm a bit over the top about it. And I apologize to anyone listening to me now, but but it is possible to do something like this. And I think that there is room on that cheese board and we should squash up the brie and the camembert and put in the social enterprise cheese right there in the middle. Yeah, completely agree. And I suppose one of the unique things about LEAF is you deliberately set it up in very disadvantaged areas. Mm -hmm. um, so your, your nurseries are in those communities where that maybe feel forgotten about um, and so very much catering to those children. Um, yeah, 77 of them are in areas of deprivation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder, could you, I mean, it sort of feels in the early years sector that we're at a bit of a, a, a crisis point between, um, you know, children maybe turning up to, to childcare um, and early years education being a little less developed than they might have been in other years due to the lockdowns and not feeling um, like they got uh, adequate um, kind of social interaction in those those very early years. What are the kinds of things that you are seeing um, in children that uh, are maybe posing more of a challenge um, since the pandemic than than in previous years? Um, I guess we could put it in like a triangle. There's there are three areas really. There's their um, language and communication. There's their their personal, social and emotional um, development, and there's their physical development. I think they're the three areas where we're seeing a decline in uh, children's confidence and competence in that in those areas. Um, and I think there are many reasons for why, why that's the case um, that are not just COVID, but about bigger society positions as well. So we have currently the child obesity rate, which is rocketing, you know, um, and that's a lot to do with you know bigger structural issues around food uh, food manufacturing uh, levels of sugar in food poverty and people buying cheaper food and that it's full of fat and sugar um all of those kind of big structural issues um the physical development then uh, is then impacts on that and and also people are more fearful about leaving their children out to play um the word play seems to be kind of lost it's like a it's like an you know afterthought when actually children learn through play and they learn to, to practice their life skills through play. They learn to uh, develop their emotions by testing the waters through play. Play is so important. It's such a small word and it's such a big science. And um, it's almost um, it's almost being rejected now. And so I think one of the 
the issues we saw in COVID are, you know, and what we were seeing beforehand was the failure to accept that play is a significant method by which children learn. And there are panics out there that, you know, if you go to a nursery and you just play all day, you won't learn anything. There are many layers to play and play is also about planned and structured and supported and following children's interest and extended and differentiated. And it's all of those things, as well as children just having time, just slowing down. So actually, in one way, um, the pandemic uh, kind of highlighted the kind of difficulties many children experience is because of society's shift and change and focus on staying indoors and um, you know not allowing them to take risks and not allowing them to be outside and not allowing them to play um, you know in the way that they want to play um, at the same time you know those children who for example stayed with us during the, the during the pandemic who were you know children of key key workers um, had a much happier time in the nursery because we could slow everything down and they could actually deeply play you could actually observe them really spending time engaging in one particular thing and really extending it. So in, in ways, it highlights one of the things that we're missing, which is the appreciation of the power of play. And the consequences were then that the children, um, you know, they, uh, they lost their confidence in physical development because a lot of them weren't allowed out because they were frightened to, to set out. I mean, this is no criticism of parents in particular. This is like, this is what people, you know, well, at one point we had half an hour out in the day and all the parks were closed. And if you live in a block in the middle of East London and stuff, and there's not really a park to be had, what do you do? Um, and so that was that. Then social skills. Um, I can't tell you how many parents said afterwards, I had no idea how friendships matter so much to children as young as two. And they were really surprised by that and how their children missed that kind of uh, experience of being with other children. And that's really an important thing. Um, and it's an important thing from, for the LEAF model, actually, that children benefit when they're from all different class, culture, age, gender, everything. You know, when there is a mix, they really do benefit from, from each other because there is a, a kind of a a learning space where they kind of you know work together and work around things and understand things better from that kind of empathetic kind of perspective if they're led by of course empathetic staff um, and so they didn't have that experience at all and some of them didn't even get to see their extended family so it was really quite a tough time for them so their what we noticed is um their level of tolerance was less their level of um anxiety was higher separation was more more tricky for them um actually uh you know people often talk about temper tantrums i'm not really keen on that language but um you know but ch children's frustration was greater and quicker um uh, passions and routines were lost so parents were saying to us they never sleep they're up all night you know they're here they're there i can't get them to do anything so one of the things we spend a lot of time doing and often people are a bit sneery about this but routine is really important to children and so re you know, re sort of reintroducing routines, parents were so grateful, you know, that they went home and they went to bed and they got up in the morning and stuff. So that was that was very important. And we noticed that in the more disadvantaged communities, that was a bigger issue. So the children were going to bed in the afternoon, they were up half the night. Um, parents were very stressed. Um, and so that was very important for them. And that begs another important point about nurseries and preschools and child and you know, the whole kind of settings is that routine matters routine shouldn't be sneered at it shouldn't be looked at as something oh you know that's designed for the setting it's actually really important for the children and then language they really i mean we were really surprised by the delay in the language uh the delay in listening uh, mm -hmm. The delay in pronunciations, the extension of words, the vocabulary sort of became quite um, reduced. Um, but then, on the other hand, for some children, lockdown was amazing. You know, they lived in a, you know, live in a very, um, you know, lucky house, you know, with a garden uh, mm -hmm. where their parents could work and kind of work things out between them where there was um, much more engagement, much more language, much more activities. Um, and that was supported by the whole sector, really who pulled together their kind of digital skills pretty quickly and, you know, translated that into um, 
into our activities, videos, YouTubes. Gosh, we did all sorts of things we never thought was possible. So I think there, you know, we we have to be we have to be sort of careful also that um, we don't just bucket all the children together, and that some children who are from poor families but have a garden and have an well engaged parents did quite well, um, and some children did a lot less. So yes, of course, it highlights the gap, but it also highlights the bigger philosophical question about what is it that we want for our children and um, what is it that the early years why is it that it matters and have we still stuck in the debate between it's a personal choice and therefore you know some children are lucky and some children are not are the kind of you know traditional ubuntu notion that you know actually it takes a village to rear the child and we all have a part to play in in, in every child's sort of uh, success not just those of our own family yes yeah. absolutely I think you touched on a great point there as well, <clears throat> that there was lots of innovation during the pandemic um, mm. in in schools and, and in preschools, nurseries, everywhere, really, in terms of bringing in technology and using that um, to your advantage. Mm -hmm. And I guess, uh, you know, have you continued, say, in LEAF, have you continued on using some of the tech um, technologies that you introduced? Um, so that's my first question. And then secondly, for a, for an early years educator, how how are they dealing with this? Are they having to you know change practice every day to account for some of the things that you talked about there? How has it impacted um, early years educators? Um, so we have a perfect storm at the moment. Uh, we have a huge shortage in recruitment, a real shortage of level three um, uh, practitioner teachers. Um, we have um, a, a kind of, I don't know how you describe this, but lots of young people have been trained without ever being in a nursery or in a setting. So then when they come to a setting, they're a little bit freaked out by the reality of, you know, of, of uh, having 30, 40, 50 children in a space and mm -hmm. meeting their ind individual needs as well as the group need. So they're not staying. Um, and some people are testing the water about whether this is the time they want to do something different. So they come in with this perhaps sometimes kind of rose tinted view of what it might be to work with small children. And and they're a little bit um, uh, exhausted by it, to be honest. So so we have that we have. Therefore, we also have lots of vacancies. Um, I don't know how much of this is our European uh, changes with Brexit. Um, we at least we had 15 percent of our staff were. European and we kept quite a lot of them but during COVID a lot of them went back to Spain particularly Spain um a few to Italy a few to Poland I really miss my European staff actually um I think they bring a really wonderful sort of different um kind of thinking about things and work ethic as well um but you know we are where we are um and so um we you know all of those things compound to have this uh, re sort of retention problem and recruitment problem that then is compounded by the fact that you know a lot of people working in the early year sector are very committed to the children and they're very committed to their environment so they'll do long hours they'll do uh, overtime and then they become exhausted so you kind of have this kind of vicious circle where they want to look after the children well they want to make sure they're getting what they need they stay longer they get tired uh can't fill the gaps and so you know then eventually they they leave um you know and that is a real i mean that's a real disaster because what we're seeing is and this isn't just leap this is across across the piece is um some of your more experienced staff retiring um, are just, you know, going early, are changing their, their career, are moving sideways, going into health, perhaps, uh, and not staying in the sector. So that then has an impact. So you have the sort of inexperienced coming in a little frightened. You have the experienced who are exhausted because they're trying to hold the thing together. You have this recruitment gap that is uh, really hard to fill. And we're doing a massive amount of things to, do, to, to try and address it. Um, but if the people aren't there, the people aren't there, so to speak. So even though, for example, I've always loved apprentices. Long before they were called apprentices, they were called trainees. I had them. And some of mine are, you know, stayed with me for 20 years, up to 20 years. In fact, our Michelle, our um, apprentice manager, started as an apprentice 17 years ago. You know, so they're, you know, they're, but they, that takes time. It takes time to get apprentices, you know, really supported and trained and, you know, and, and sort of bedded in. So there, we are in this really awkward position. 
And then we do have, particularly in our part of the, you know, the sector, there are then more demands from the children and their parents about yes. uh, their, you know, their needs and how we meet those needs. Um, and so you're in that kind of, you're in that sort of storm at the moment and um, you can address it sort of structurally and you can address it um, in a sort of well-being way, but either or, they take money <laughs> and it takes time. And so, yes, you can increase the salaries. I mean, we've always aimed to be a London living wage employer. We're not there yet. We're 72% of the way there for every single member of staff to be at the, as a minimum on the London living wage. But that takes a while. We've always been very good on things like pensions. I know some of my staff look at me kind of slightly bright eyed and say, why are you giving us 7% pension? And I say, because you'll be old for a long time, girls, and you do not want to be old, ill and poor um and um and uh you know and so that's one of the things and you know you can do things like you know have flexible shifts and um you know short hours but in the end you can only go so far because you are delivering a service that starts in the morning at eight o'clock and that finishes in the evening at six six thirty so you can be as flexible as you like and everybody wants to work four hours here and two hours there and whatever you in the end you can't do that because the service is open but also your children need security and they need the regular people and they need to know who's coming and going and they need to be, they, the routine needs to be steady and secure for them. Yeah. And so it's a real, it's a real, it's a real trick at the moment. And my heart goes out to everybody in the sector who's struggling. But uh, the one thing I could say to them is you're not alone. Uh, that's not reassuring, but it is, it is the truth because you do feel, well, maybe I'm a terrible employer, you know, maybe, they're all leaving to go somewhere else because we're not kind or we're not empathetic or we're not meeting their needs or we're not giving them enough promotion. Or, and so we've done staff council, we've done staff surveys, and the three things that come up are exactly that. Um, you know, flexibility of work hours and tiredness. And well, um, and the second thing is salaries, you know, and, and we're squeezed on salaries because, you know, the funding is is completely, uh, you know, insufficient. Yeah. Um, and I mean, was to say, we're not dividend driven. So every penny we have, we give to the staff. Um, and that still can't necessarily drive that. Um, and tiredness. And they, they're the three, they're the three reasons that people are going. And a lot of people don't want to go, but they feel like they don't go. They're own personal physical well-being and their own personal mental well-being will be affected because they just can't carry that kind of um stress and i feel for them i miss them you know i like my staff i like them a lot and mm -hmm. i hate to see any of them go but i don't mind if they go into the sector because we've trained them up or they've been promoted into say i don't mind that but when they give up entirely on mm -hmm. working with children it just grieves me deeply yeah absolutely and june um i know that you're asked regularly for um, you know your thoughts on how we can change this structurally from a, a government viewpoint but are there some you know if you had to give advice to the department for education uh, right now what would you say about this staffing crisis and and how, what help could they give the sector well i have the the voice of neil leach ringing in my ears when i say this but you know he'll always say you know increase the funding given that um that seems to be an argument that's um, fallen on deaf ears forever. Um, I'm currently working with Ofsted to um, examine examine the possibilities of more freedom in terms of how we uh, balance qualified and unqualified staff. I reject the whole ratio thing entirely. I think the idea of putting an extra child or two children on an already stressed member of staff is appalling. I mean, it's appalling, both from the child's perspective and from the staff member's perspective. And there's absolutely no evidence, except one very odd report that suggests that there would be any benefit to parents in terms of fee reduction. Because I wouldn't reduce my fees. I'd simply pay my staff more because they have more responsibility. Um, I don't want to do it anyway. Um, but I think that's just, just really badly thought out. And because they do it elsewhere does not make it right. You know, that we should be following what's best, not what's, you know, what's already happening that people aren't happy with. So I, I was trying to turn it on its head and think, well, if at the moment we have 55 percent of staff need to be level three or above art, you know, well, if we had some flex on that, 
and we chose staff who maybe not level three but level two are unqualified but very experienced and we chose how we delegated them particularly at the beginning and the end of the day so at least our staff could go home on time now we've introduced a number of things to enable the staff to go home on time because that's all they often ask for can i just go home on time um, which is not an unreasonable ask, really. Um, and so we've introduced very short shifts in the afternoon, you know, like three to six. Very popular, actually, particularly with parents. Um, but so, yeah, so we've been trying to do that. But if we could then allocate our indeed, you know, um, delegate our staff in the way we want to uh, more evenly across the sea, you know, the setting, then maybe that would give us a bit of more flexibility without actually affecting anything wider in terms of you know chat staff child ratios or everything and then maybe the, the the kind of payoff for that is we have to make sure that they're the staff who are being trained and you know there's other stuff that's going on to guarantee the quality because i worry about this i worry that if we do that when we know that the more qualified your staff are the better they you know the more confident they are and that's very evident when you do an offset inspection as well the more confident the teaching is it's, it's really re often related to the qualification so i have no I only not disagreeing with that. And in fact, we do the LEAF degree. We do the LEAF foundation degree. We do the LEAF top-up degree. And I will be doing a LEAF MA. So I'm not against that. But right now, if we could have some level of flexibility that enabled us to think about how we, where we place our staff and, and you know, how we work things out. And that could mean that, you know, we have to make sure everybody has got pediatric first aid. And we have to make sure everybody has got some kind of... Um, I don't know, basic qualifications. And that's one thing I'm doing. And I'm having this conversation next week and I've invited a number of people across the sector to attend just to hear their thoughts about it. Um, and just let's think about what it might mean and what, you know, what are the kind of, you know, advantages and disadvantages. The other thing is, for some time now, I've been worrying about the fact that a lot of the young people who come to work with us, even on work placement, have got the health and social care uh, level three. And when we did some research, um, and again, somebody out there can kind of correct me on this, I'd be delighted. But we found that that is the more popular course in school. So when you're thinking about, you know, coming down the T-level, you know, approach and everything else, mm -hmm. that when they do one of those kind of uh, health and social care courses, they don't tend to do the early years one. And a lot of them... Um, when I talk to them and say, why did you choose those? They say, because we thought that covered everything. We thought health and social care actually was a broad kind of uh, descriptor and that our children would be in there. We didn't realize that early years and care is a completely kind of different one. Yes. So we have written a top up to convert the health and social care into the early years um, education qualification. So we're testing that at the moment. I always test everything in-house first to make sure that if we get it wrong, we get it wrong with our own poor staff as opposed to anyone else. Um, but we will be rolling that out. And I'm hoping that's another way of, in a way, kind of, you know, collecting in people who um, have started their career and actually get them in the right, you know, on the right trajectory. And then the third thing I think is... Um, we need to, to, to the DFE. It's actually not the DFE, though. It's, it's, it's uh, DWP and a number of other departments. But apprentices, um, we need to do more to really nurture them and support them. And we need to figure out that the levy system becomes more generous and more, um, you know, easily accessible. Um, because apprentices, you know, are a very, very good pipeline into the sector. And, and what can we do more to uh, kind of, in a way, make sure that they're successful? And I think the DfE is actually looking at, at this with its other departments. But I think there would be my three, top three tips to them at the moment to look at, you know, the health and social care, do we need, you know, do they need to do more to make sure schools are offering it in a broader way? Do we need to rewrite it? You know, in the meantime, we'll do the top up, but is that, you know, is that the way forward? um obviously funding funding us better is fun, you know structurally that's the best option um yes. and then i guess the last conversation we have to have and it was started a little bit by the duchess of cambridge um i don't know if we call her the princess of wales now but you know um, <laughs> um she started the conversation about what what is the point of early years you know what do the public understand by early years and i think we still have to pull that together because I think we do operate in, a, in an environment, I think the whole West does actually, where your voice isn't necessarily heard. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we we aren't powerful in the sense that our voices aren't powerful. And so we do need to have a powerful voice. And I think bringing parents with us to understand what 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 it is that they're paying for and what it is that we're offering and what it is why um, early years is part of the national infrastructure. You know, if you want people to go to work, you need to have really good quality nurseries. But you don't just have nurseries stuck up any old place. They have to be really good for those children. Why should they suffer for a policy we've created or an economic structure we've created uh, to, you know, to make most of the society a two person economy? You know, mm-hmm. you can't buy a flat, you can't rent a flat, you can't buy anything here unless at least at least two incomes. Uh, so we've made it to work like that. So we, the children shouldn't be punished for our economic, maybe sometimes foolishness. Uh, so I think that is really a very powerful debate that we need to get our voices behind and really cohere. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you've kind of highlighted the the work or the labour market argument, um, but also uh, the just the child development uh, point of view. Like it's the most one of the most sensitive periods in a child's life. So it's it is should be on equal footing with some of the the other periods uh, during childhood and um yeah absolutely second making still making the case for that um mm-hmm. uh, and 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 helping parents to understand that um thank you so much june that's been super interesting um i think we are going to pass over i've seen we've been getting loads and loads of questions um in the the chat um yeah. so let me pick out a couple um so we've an interesting one from <clears throat> mark uh brooks here which is uh what needs to happen to attract more men into the early years sector there's only three percent uh of, of early years educators are male that's absolutely true and um 10 years ago i started a campaign men into childcare, and if you go on our website um you will find, Mark, you will find lots of uh, reports on that. So we looked at it from three perspectives. One, what is it about, what is it the men want to do? Why are they not attending? Um, two, what is it, how does it benefit the children? And three, how does it benefit the sector widely? And there are, all three are positives. Uh, you know, there are there is no reason why we shouldn't be supporting men. And we have a recruitment crisis and half the population is male. So why are we not working to attract those? So I think... Um, there, and what happens, it seems like there's a kind of interest for a while and then it sort of droops again. There's an interest for a while. And a lot of it is driven by, I think, project funding. So um, fundamentally, uh, we need to build it into the national strategy, I think, to make sure that we understand why men in the sector are good for uh, are good for children, are good for the staff and actually are good for the sector. We've done a lot of work at LEAF on this. Our, we have 11.6% of our staff are men, which I know sounds pathetic, but it's better than 3%. Um, and we've just, for example, finished the very first all-male uh, apprenticeship uh, cohort. Uh, it was small because it was, do- was done in, co- in COVID, but it's very interesting when you talk to why men want to come into nurseries and why not, and the kind of barriers. Um, I've written a great deal about that on blogs and um, chapters in my books and uh, all sorts of things. So I'm not going to go on and on about it. But effectively, what I'm saying is that there are techniques that actually work very well, um, but we need a national narrative to support it. And actually, the big two big change um, agents in this are the head teacher, are you know the head senior manager, whatever they're called, but the person in charge has to really give them their backing. And then you have to get women behind this, actually, because men are often nervous to go in because they're fearful of being uh, called names, uh, so negative association with paedophilia and all of that sort of thing. So they need to know that when a parent, and parents do object, when, that the, the head, the manager, the senior, will back them all the way. And sometimes um, they haven't. Sometimes people have just you know, done a bit of garden leave or pushed pushed to the side or, you know, put in, uh, you know, ad- additional uh, supervision or um, put in webcams or whatever they're called, you know, that to me is completely opting out. You know, you have to there, you have to back your member of staff. Of course, you've got to check if there's, uh, you know, some truth in their allegations, but quite often it's about their insecurity about the fact that a man is, you know, looking after their child, particularly the younger, the younger age. Um, when you get parents on side, they are your best advocates. And so many parents will say to me, um, I was a bit nervous to start with June. I had no idea what it felt like to have some men in, in the sector. It's so unusual. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, you know, she or he has thrived and, you know, they're such very interesting and in, they're interested in it. They're interested in the children. They bring something different to the, to, to the party. And, and that's right, because that's what we want to do. So that, you know, the world is made up of men and women and therefore we need to kind of honor that in some way. So, so yeah, so good question. I totally support it. I've done a lot of work on it. There's lots written out there. And if you want to get behind it, you know, sometimes you have to take a first step yourself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would be nowhere if I hadn't taken first steps myself. You know, we still wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have had a social enterprise behind me if I hadn't done something and stepped into that area of discomfort and tried to create something uh, when everyone thought you were completely around the bend. Um, so, um, you know, uh, you're right. It is important. Do read our reports and do drop me a note. Um, and there is, uh, I think I, I wrote a piece in the um, in my A to Z book, and I certainly written a book about uh, encouraging dads because that has a really positive knock on on that as well. So um, anyway, there you go. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Kim Holland. Uh, what policies are you rejecting, and why? Um, how do you see early years differently to how? it currently is regarding policies and social enterprise? Um, the policy I'm rejecting, uh, Kim, is the ratios. Um, I rejected it in 2012. I rejected it in 2013. It came up again in 2017. I rejected it then. I'm rejecting it now. I may not lose. I may lose the battle now that Liz Truss is our prime minister, but, you know, I'm still rejecting it. Um, in relation to social enterprise, um, during lockdown, when a lot of our staff were furloughed, um, I don't know, I must have been hyperactive. I'm pretty hyper anyway, but I must have been even more hyperactive. Um, and I didn't have to worry about so many of my staff because they were sort of safely furloughed. And I wrote a number of books. Um, and one of them was on social leadership. And I wrote it with uh, Mona Sacker, who's a uh, associate professor at uh, Middlesex University. Um, I was really keen on understanding what social leadership needs to look like. So one of the policies that I would be very keen on is that we explore what social leadership means and what it looks like and how it drives a social purpose and how it clarifies a social purpose. And most people working in the early years are functioning around a social purpose because generally we want to do the best for our children. But how we do it is entirely up to us. So I think... Um, sort of, in a way, defining our own leadership, uh, you know, defining the way we we drive social enterprises became quite important to me during that um, COVID period. Um, and when we had some, some just a little bit of time to think and to um, just reflect, because I realized as we came out of that, that things had to change. We could not go back to how it was, you know, where we're being pushed by policies and pushed by, um, often funding crisis and we needed to be able to sort of step into our own shoes and consider what social leadership and social purpose and social justice look like and therefore how we create like now having a conversation it's a sort of democratic process of actually engaging with with other people and talking about this i mean conversation is very powerful and at least it's part of our pedagogy as, and it's certainly part of our social leadership uh, never underestimate the power of a conversation and actually when you formalize them I, they become part of the way you are. You it helps you create a culture. And if your culture is about social justice, then you're, in a way, you're defining your policies as a consequence of that. Um, and you're, you're leading in, in, in that way. And so uh, this isn't a plug for my book by any means, but it is what we wrote about. And it might help you if you did read it and you shared it maybe with your students. And I'd be very interested in your thoughts on, you know, where we got it right and where we got it wrong, where you think it's impossible. But, you know, for me, that was that's that's very important. And I'm going to do much more work around social leadership uh, this year as well um, as we go on. Yes, thank you. Um, another not only a plug for your book, but also I really enjoy the podcast. So if any of you have um, I want to check out June's podcast, she she does a weekly podcast. and It's it's wonderful. I love it. Um, so do check that out as well. Um, I have another we have another question from Sydney. Uh, Thornberry. Ah. Perinatal mental health is massively oversubscribed. Um, yeah. Are you seeing mothers struggling more? Uh, 
uh, hello to Sid. Um, she's another great social entrepreneur, actually. Um, runs the um, art house in Wakefield. Um, but yes, uh, we are. We definitely are. Um, and, um, you know, loneliness is the... Um, people always think of loneliness associated with older people, and it is indeed associated with older people. But actually, the, the highest proportion of people who suffer, suffer from loneliness are new, um, new, new parents. And actually, um, I think that we need to think about the way we deliver services. So what we do right now is we have, we had Sure Start and then it kind of merged into children's centres and now they're called family hubs. But the ethos of them is about, you know, creating a network around the family and making access to those kind of services that Sid's referring to here actually accessible. And... Uh, you know, I think it's only 75 local authorities are now having access to family hubs. Uh, sure Start is um, a kind of anorexic version of what it was. And children's centres are very much about tech and about access to information. So I think when we build one of the things that what I wanted to do when I built the LEAF model, and again, it's very easily accessible for anyone else to do, was to build in a multi-generational strand into your social pedagogy. So that actually you saw yourself as a center of the community and as a catalyst for, for community engagement. And so it's, you know, creating kind of opportunities for parents to meet together for conversations, for events, all of those things actually should be part of the way we do things around here. Because you never know when someone is lonely. And some people are very good at hiding it. Some people are, um, you know, people can be judged. We can be, we can, we can be really judgy, really. And, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, she's married. She's got this husband. She lives in a nice part of the, you know, the, the, the neighborhood, etc. Does it matter, you know, when you're on your own and you might be that your partner is away a lot of the time? Does it matter that, you, you know, you're shopping at uh, John Lewis and somebody else is shopping? you know, in the charity shops. It's like we make judgments very quickly about these people. And actually for a parent, it's loneliness is loneliness is loneliness. And that has an implication on their relationship with their child. And it, it actually affects their mental health and it becomes an issue. So I think we have to sometimes step away from our own judgments about what we think is happening with parents and who needs help and who doesn't. And actually our business model, our our pedagogical model, our operational model, our practice, everything should actually also build in that notion that we have the power to do stuff in the community and that not just the power to do it, we ought to do it. And we can do it again in terms of our geography and in terms of where we are. If you're a rural setting, it would look different to say if you're a setting in a suburbs or you're a little small setting in a tiny end of somewhere or you're like us right in the heart of London, whether you're in Soho or whether you're in Paddington or whatever. It doesn't matter. Your community is your community and actually part of your pedagogy. And we call it multi-generational approach because it's not just about uh, older people. It's about parents. It's about young people. It's teens and toddlers. It's it's all sorts of things. But it creates that kind of net, that sort of what Robert Putnam would call that sort of social capital. And I think that should be part of any setting. And back to Kim's point about policies. If I had a policy opportunity um, I would build in that when you're designing a nursery or a setting of any kind, you're thinking about your contribution to the community and connecting and making those connections. So when you're desperate and you're in need, you know, we know people. And I know, like, for example, it's really hard right now. There's so few health visitors. You know, the speech and language services are sort of skeletal. Um, you know, CAMS, I don't know even if it exists half the time anymore. So, but in a way, it's about us finding other partners and, you know, small charities and local connections and partnerships and friendships and working with older people and stuff and finding different ways of connecting people together and building people up so that actually that in a way the kind of consequences of isolation and loneliness and um fear is kind of mitigated by some of the ways we're going we're going forward and i think you might think well you know isn't it isn't it a health service should be delivering that i don't know that it needs to be necessarily i think sometimes all they need is to feel part of something mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we have Derry Hannan. Um, how can LEAF thinking infuse primary and secondary schools? I advocate 20% of school time to be for kids to explore uh, their own questions, purposes, interests and concerns. 
Um, I think you go back to your values about what you want, you know, Derry, when you're thinking about um, what does education look like and what does it mean? And I, I feel, um, you know, schools have been really pushed into a kind of rabbit hole of targets and measures and delivery models, um, which is pretty tough when you want to give children space to think and to play. Um, and play isn't something that you can do after your work is finished, um, which is a common enough statement. Um, are you can, when you're very good, you know, you can go out to play and then children who aren't so good get to not go to play, which must to me is abuse because they're the very children who need to play and who need to be outside and who need to have that opportunity to sort of, you know, let, let go of the kind of, we don't know what they're carrying inside them sometimes. So I think what you have to do, Derry, really is reframe what you want to do with your 20% in terms of your pedagogical kind of narrative. I love the social pedagogy model and uh, it's not used enough in the early years. It's much more found in social work. It's much more of a European model, um, uh, but it's built on the notion of relationships and the warmth that, you know, relationships are, you know, how important they are in terms of warmth and engagement and support. And it's built around the notion of um, the child's kind of ability to to become, to become, yeah, you know, a I don't know, all-rounded person. And so I think for that, it's very important that you actually articulate that so that there's an educational purpose to what you're doing and that, you know, comforts your head teacher, comforts the inspectors, but also gives you confidence to be able to push for why you want to do what you want to do. Too often in the sector, and this isn't a school thing, this is an early years thing, too often in the sector, we don't use the language of teaching enough. We, for, we call people practitioners, um, which drives me to distraction because, you know, we're practicing nothing. Um, we're teaching. And whether, you know, people get worried, oh, but, you know, what about babies? When you touch a child, when you engage a child, when you change a nappy, when you wipe their face, when you touch their hands, when you sit on the floor with them, when you sit and sing together, that is teaching and care is integrated into that idea. And, you know, if you're not sure about that, reread your Tina Bruce here. But so, for, but, but what do parents appreciate? They understand that world of teaching. They understand the idea of going to a nursery or a setting or whatever and, and being taught. These are very important concepts and we don't actually own them enough. We don't talk about what I call the art, craft and science of early years teaching which it is, it completely has an art, craft and science to it. And um, we don't use language to describe what we're doing quite often. Um, we don't actually know what we mean when we talk about play enough. We don't actually own our own, um, our own sort of professionalism. We tend to give in or be humble or, you know, be uh, reticent about saying things. But, you know, the, the, when we're applying anything, when we're in the, the setting and we're thinking about what we're doing or how we're planning things or how we're setting experiences up or how we're talking to the children, how we're talking to the parents, you need to frame that into the science of what you're doing. So you use some of the language that, um, you know, you model, you demonstrate, you narrate, you know, you sustain shared questions, you, you know, you describe, you... Um, you know, you observe, you plan, all of those things are science in themselves. But we need to own this and we need to get as good as schools about talking about teaching and learning in that way. And if you're already in a school, then it's really about um, articulating that from that perspective of the age of the child. So the development of the child then sets the scene for the kind of, you know, tactics and teaching methodology you choose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important. And I'm, I've been dry, you know, driving my poor staff crazy with these kind of conversations. But, but look, we've got 52% outstanding. And I think a lot of that is because they're very confident about talking about what they do and why they do things and how it benefits the children and mm -hmm. owning that. And I think, you know, Montessori, Maria Montessori and Margaret Macmillan and some of the greats of the past must be turning in their graves right now, listening to us, not knowing what we're talking about. Susan Isaacs, you know, where they all had a theory and they all had a sort of a, a set of um, uh, means by which they would deliver that theory. And I think we need to step back into that and own it. And when you mm -hmm. own it, you feel more confident. And when somebody argues with you, you can actually push back in a much more articulate and confident way because you have a theory of of how you teach and how you support so mm -hmm. if you know back to kim's point about policies kim if i had a chance if i was 
you know, prime minister for two hours, the first thing that would happen was the word practitioner would be banned forever and a day. <laughs> um, so we were all early years educators from, from now on. <laughs> yeah. um, we have time for one more question and it's from uh, Anne-Marie Kinlock. Um, how might we better include parents in the education and development of young children? Um, well, I think um, we need to have more conversations with them. And it almost goes back to the point I was just making. Because when I decided in 2017 to stop using any term uh, except a leaf teacher, uh, I thought I'd get a lot of pushback. But I asked parents and I said to parents, you know, when you can't remember their names, what do you call, you know, um, you know, Tallulah's, Tallulah's person, key person. I'm trying not to use the word teacher at this point. Said, what do you call them? And they said, the teacher. Then we did a survey with the children. And what we did a survey of what do the children call you when they can't remember your name, teacher. So um, that was the first thing for us. So we involved, and that led to what I, again, these conversations with parents. Uh, we call them pedagogical conversations. And I use two particular words in here. Um, one is because and the other is so. So when you're talking to a parent at the end of the day, on a, on a more planned activity, whatever, you know, you're introducing the idea of because and so. So you're saying, you know, Tallulah had a really good day today. Um, you know, she's a little bit muddy and, you know, her Louis Vuitton coat is torn. But that's because she was outside a great deal today and she was climbing and she was counting and she was, you know, and you could go on and on. So there's the key thing. So. We'd like to do this more with her because she clearly learns better outside. She's designed, you know, she's building her mathematical confidence um, in, in, in the, how she does things, describing that to the parent. And so tomorrow, could you put her in, a, uh, you know, more suitable clothes or whatever? So you're using the term because and so in every conversation with parents. And we found this really works. Um, because, Amory, what happens is you you frame the conversation with, within the relationship you have with the person, you know, and there's one thing that good early years people have is they build good relationships, and if you build a good relationship with the parent. So if you're talking to, you know, uh, a professor who happens to be a professor of early years about how their Tallulah is doing, you use the language slightly differently. If you're talking to someone whose English is very scanty and they're not sure and you know you'll use the language different your message will be the same though what you're showing is what we're doing is because this is part of their learning and so this is the benefit and this is how you can help us and so I think that's really important so the power of the pedagogical conversation to me is immense and should be and for us it's part of our pedagogy and for, it's part of our arts you know craft and science of teaching it is hugely immense and of course it's also used with colleagues and it's also used with policymakers because you're explaining what your thinking is in a very uh, sort of in a way, in a kind of personal way. To do that, of course, you need to be quite knowledgeable and quite well trained. And that needs to be part of the culture of your environment. So, you know, one of the things, one of the chapters in the social leadership book was all about how do you create a culture of conversation to enable those things to happen? So that's just, I mean, there are many ways, Anne-Marie, to answer your question, but I would say, if, you know, one of the most successful things we've done is to really develop the pedagogical conversation and that helps parents understand what you're doing. And in that way, they become more of a voice for you. And that's what we need. Ultimately, we need the parents of the UK to be behind us, shouting for us, not shouting to have the fees reduced or getting sidelined on one of those things. That's but understanding why we matter, because if we get that right, then we will be able to adjust uh, fees and everything else because we will get properly funded. And because, uh, you know, we have the voters behind us pushing the politicians to make long term thoughtful decisions as opposed to short term uh, interventions. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, on that note, I think we're just about out of time. Um, all that's left is to do is thank you, June, for a really uh, fruitful and uh, rich discussion. I have certainly learned a lot uh, this afternoon. Um, so thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who um, posted questions and comments throughout. I think it's been uh, a really useful hour. Um, the last thing is we have Derry is going to post a quick uh, feedback survey. So if you have time uh, to fill that out, that would be great um, just to, to give us some feedback on, on these sessions. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Derry, have you had a chance to post that yet? 
Oh, and sorry, I should say as well uh, that as a thank you for filling out the survey, there is a £50 uh, bookshop voucher. So um, that's a, a good incentive to, to fill that out and, and to buy June's book with, with the voucher. <laughs> yes, thank you, Fula. I love that. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you.